When Art Spiegelman published Mouse, a cartoon about his father's experience of surviving the Holocaust, in 1986, people didn't quite know what to make of it. The book ultimately won a Pulitzer Prize, but a separate and new category had to be created. It wasn't fiction, it wasn't autobiography, and it used the medium of comics to talk about one of the horrific incidents in collective history. Spiegelman changed the way we think about comics, which are today considered a medium to represent anything and not just superheroes or funny animals. Mouse has spawned a generation of people wrestling with their parents and their own experiences. I spoke with Hilary Shute, an expert on comic books, about Art Spiegelman's achievement, what it changes in the American understanding of its own many histories, and how best to read a book that combines words and pictures to convey the ineffable. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. Thank you, Hilary, for being here and for joining me on Think About It today. My pleasure. I'm really happy to talk to you about Art Spiegelman's Mouse. I'm really happy to talk about that book, too. <laughs> so I wanted to start us out. I had Ava Chin on this podcast a couple weeks ago on Maxine Horn Kingston's The Woman Warrior, mm -hmm. which is also a memoir of a childhood, mm -hmm. a girlhood among ghosts. And Art Spiegelman's book is really definitely about him growing up among ghosts. Mm -hmm. The first line of Maxine Horn Kingston's book is, you must not tell anyone, my mother said, what I'm about to tell you. So that book, Woman Warrior, is kind of a transgression against the parents' injunction to say, please don't tell the story to anybody. Mm -hmm. This is private. This is not for the public. This is not for anybody else. And then when I reread Mouse now, the same thing happens in the beginning of the story mm -hmm. where Art Spiegelman is trying to reconstruct his father's story, which will become the story of his survival and his mother's survival of the Holocaust. And then... At the end of that little section where he talks about the pre-war story, how he had another girlfriend before he met the mother, the father says to Art, but this isn't so proper, so respectful. I can tell you other stories, but such private things I don't want you should mention. And then Art says, okay, okay, I promise. And then he puts it in the book. Mm -hmm. So the book starts out as a kind of transgression, mm -hmm. kind of a betrayal almost of the father who yeah. says, this is the story I want to tell you. And then Art says right away, okay, I keep the secret and then he puts it in the book. Right. I mean, one of the things I think is so interesting about Mouse as a text that is enacting that transgression against the parent right. is that in the family unit that Art is coming out of and that gets so much attention in the book, there's this dual thing happening where his father doesn't want him to tell the story and his mother's desire for him to tell the story, his mother who committed suicide in 1968, is driving him at the same time. So there's this kind of contradiction of going against the desire of the father and at the same time trying to fulfill the desire of the mother against the desire of the father. It's very complicated and it's one of the things I find the most moving about Mouse. So that's interesting. So you thought the mother's presence, the mother who committed suicide in 1968, who survived the Holocaust and then committed suicide. And Art is in his 20s at that time? Art is born in 1948 and is yeah, 20, 20 when his mother commits suicide. So and then you think that drives him to tell this. And the, the mother did record her story. You know? The mother recorded the mother. Her name is Anja yeah. Spiegelman. So Anja Spiegelman wrote down her experiences, you know, being in the camps and her experiences right. that she had during the war, after the war, right. in notebooks which she told Art as a young person, I hope you'll be interested in these someday when you get older. And he and was then, a kid. And, and was, he was a kid and didn't care. And then when she committed suicide, her husband, Vladek Spiegelman, burned her notebooks. Right. Therefore cutting off Art's access 
not only to the informational content of the notebooks, but to a kind of narrative of his mother's life right. that he's sort of constantly mm -hmm. seeking in Mouse, even though Mouse is so centered around his father-son filial relationship. So, I mean, talking about ghosts, that the ghost of Andres Spiegelman is always there. And even, I think, mm -hmm. In that short episode that you mentioned, right. we can see a picture of her in a frame right. as they're talking. So this is so on, on a mantelpiece. So Anja is the the wife and the mother who killed herself. Right. Art is going to visit his father, trying to kind of reestablish a relationship. But you're saying it's driven by finding this connection to his mother. Yes, and and also I feel like there's this sort of undercurrent of anger at his father for for destroying the notebooks, which at some point in, in Mouse, Art Spiegelman figures as murder. So the last line of Mouse One right. is the Art character, who's often called Artie in the book by his right. father, calling his father a murderer, which I still find really shocking. I mean, Art Spiegelman right. calls both of his parents, who are both, you know, survivors of the death camps, murderers in the course right. of Mouse. He calls his mother a murderer, in the Prisoner on the Hell Planet comic strip that's embedded in the book. Which and is he, about her suicide. About her suicide. He says, you murdered me, mommy, and left me here to take the rap. And he calls his father a murderer. I mean, this was this was such a big deal in terms of second generation literature when it came right. out. This sort of, you're murdering the survivor, or you know, you're calling the survivor him or herself a murderer. But it's really in a book which is about... Auschwitz and the Holocaust about the Germans yes. depicted as cats murdering millions of people. Right. And so the murderers are his own parents. Right. So there's this kind of anger and perversity in that, but it's it's something he really felt. And I I find it so moving, the idea that he it shows how seriously he takes narrative and takes words, that he figures his father's burning of his mother's notebook as basically like the burning of her body. Right. You know, it's like her words are her person. Her life. Her life. The narrative is right. life in some Narrative ways. is life. So It's interesting, actually, the way you talk about it. I've never really thought about it. It's really driven by the ghost of Anja. The story that, in some strange way, he can only get his father's story. Because he's right. recording it and he's trying to reconnect with it. Right. Him. And the other story cannot be reconstructed. No, it can't be. I mean, when Art and I worked on a book together called Meta Mouse right. about Mouse, about the sort of 13-year process of making Mouse... We tried to reconstruct from notes and from family members a sort of abbreviated timeline of what might have happened to Anja. But yeah, in Metamos, you in have Meta some Mouse, testimonies there's some, from other people right, who probably knew her or were in the camps at the same time. A few people who were with her in the camps, sort of right. relatives. But there's no direct access. Right. That's gone. And it's an incredible story because his parents survive in hiding and a lot of deportations and a lot of rounds of selections and mass killings. And then they ultimately both end up in Auschwitz, in the two separate right. camps, Birkenau and Auschwitz, right. are separated, somehow are able to communicate a bit, and then they lose themselves again at right. the end of the war, and then they reconnect. So the story yes. is the second honeymoon with the last part of this book. It is, but their reconnection is the last page of the whole book, but it's undercut <laughs> by their shared headstone, which is the last image in the book, right. which very clearly has their life dates on it, their birth and death dates, and shows that Anja then elected to take right. her own life earlier right. than her right. husband, you know, died. So it's always sort of tempered. Like, there's this amazing reunion, but art is always, I think, dealing with a lot of complicated feelings about what his parents' relationship was. Since we're talking about the kind of ghostly presence of Anja, the other ghostly presence is the son who died. Right, Rishu. Rishu, who's actually doesn't just die, he's actually killed by his aunt, who doesn't want the children to be deported to Auschwitz and right. go to the gas chambers. Right. And Art never knows this boy. This is his parents' first child. Right. Who lives on as a snapshot, as a picture in his family's home. So there was a family before the war, that's kind of destroyed. And then his parents reunite and have art in Sweden after the war. So he's sort of the second son. And there's this missing son whose story we really don't know at all. Right. And volume two of Mouse is dedicated to him in part and to Art's own children. Right. So 
Yeah, the ghost brother is such an animating factor Mm -hmm. in his narrative of his relationship with his parents. I mean, he likes to joke, you know, he would have been a dentist and married a Jewish girl. (laughs) Right, right. right. (laughs) Whereas I'm a cartoonist and married, you know, a (laughs) French woman who converted, you know, all this type of thing. And, you know, it's so interesting thinking about the photograph of Risha that art actually reproduces Mm -hmm. in the frontispiece to the book under the dedication to him. But this photograph, it was such a... um, I think it was such a presence in his childhood. It hung in his parents' bedroom. His parents were formally photographed with the photograph of the son. So it's this interesting thing where images are really sort of standing in for the missing body. And it's a photograph which dates back to a time right before during the war. Yeah. So it's that present this kind of eternally preserved present, as we know photographs do. They keep that memory of a five-year-old boy. Right. But somehow art has a very ambiguous relationship to photographs, I think, in general. I think it's quite interesting. I mean, I think the deliberate choice of a graphic novel, and maybe you can say something about that. The book is published first in 1980. It's not just a transgression against his father's wishes. It's also considered something that hadn't been done. There hadn't been graphic novels about something like the Holocaust, about historical great disasters. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things to say about this that I find interesting in terms of art's choice to do this story in this form. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that this story could not exist in another form, whether Hmm. prose or film or anything. Because, for example, the way it juxtaposes photographs and drawing it's sort of not capturable in another form. Right. The fact that the book uses the conceit of an animal metaphor, you know, in which Jews are mice, Germans are cats, Polish Gentiles are pigs, Americans are dogs, and so forth and so on, that's kind of not translatable to another medium. So it's a book that's so much about its own visuality. And what do you think is a difference between the drawing where Spiegelman spends a lot of time drawing these little tiny boxes or panels yeah, and a photograph, which gives you the concrete, supposedly more truthful information. Well, I think one of the things he does that's so interesting, so there are three photographs in Mouse. They're all somehow perverse. (laughs) The photograph that he elects to show readers of his father, who was always talking about how handsome he was, is in fact a a photograph of how handsome he was, but it's him wearing a souvenir concentration camp uniform after liberation as he's making his way back to Poland. I I don't know if you know anything about this. I've tried to do some research about that phenomenon. It's really hard. I haven't really come up with anything. So in displaced persons camps, people, they're photographers. And partly I think it was done... To show we survived. Yeah. Partly it was also to show this is me because you could possibly show this to other people and say this is the person because everybody was searching for somebody. Yeah. Millions of people had been murdered. Millions more had been displaced. No one knew where anybody was. But it is an odd thing that there's a photo booth and you can go to a studio and put on a camp uniform. Right. And that that is what he sent Anja who was in Sosnovitz, like, yeah. you know, in their sort of home area awaiting right. word as proof that he was alive. I mean, it's it's like an elaborate in-joke. Like, right. here I am wearing a camp right. uniform, right. but you will know that it's clean. And he could have at and... that taken, taken a picture in civilian clothing. Great. Right. going to a photographer so, studio. It wasn't an inmate picture that we know <laughs> now some... We know documentation that the Germans photographed a lot of people right. when they arrested, when they were sort right. of booked them, kind of when they put them into the camps. So even that act that Vladek decided to embark on when he decided to take that photograph, have it taken and send that to his wife, right. it is kind of amazing. And what Art is showing, I think, in, in putting that picture of his father in the book is that, you know, photographs are unreliable. Oh, interesting. What's the other two photographs? So, is Risha so the other one is of Risha. And, and then the first one, which I find really moving, is of Art and Anja. And it opens up the embedded comic strip from 1972 called Prisoner on the Hell Planet that is sort of stuck in the middle of Mouse. Hmm. One. And this is written when he's 25, a couple of years after his mother's suicide. Right. This really is four years after his mother's suicide. Of pain. Yes. Pain. And it's another picture in which the content of the picture tells you nothing because the the strip is all about his mother's suicide and the picture is a happy picture of Anja in a bathing suit standing next to Art with her 
hand on his head, which I always interpreted as a sort of affectionate gesture. And when Art and I were talking about it once, he said he felt like it was a gesture that indicated that she wanted to stop him from growing. Like, don't grow up too much. I'm to putting my hand like on, another... your, on your head so you don't get too tall and you don't get too big. To keep him as a boy. To keep him as a boy. Because she'd lost her other boy. Right. So to keep this idea of a child. Right. So it's... It's, um, it's a very angry comic strip, that it's prisoner It's a very a angry planet. comic strip. It's the one in which he calls her a murderer. Right. Right. It's very upsetting. And it's embedded in Mouse that... Vladix, the father's second wife, gets it through a friend's son who's in college. And then Vladik sees this comic strip. And actually, it's an encounter where Vladik meets his son's own way of making sense of this past. Right. And surprisingly, is sympathetic to it. Right? It is a surprise in the book yeah. because Vladik is usually not very generous or supportive of what art is doing. Right, <laughs> especially around this idea of airing dirty laundry, which you started yeah. off our conversation right. asking me about. So so it's this moment where it's sort of like the truth is stranger than fiction. If this, if this were a fictional narrative, that would seem out of not, character. not credible, out of character, but it, it actually is what happened. That Vladik says, I'm glad you made sense of your feelings. Yeah, here. like I'm glad you got it out of your system. Right. So a lot of complicated layering of different visual media and different visual forms in mouse, right? Photographs, embedded earlier comic strips. I mean, it's so much a book about visuality in addition right. to being about the story of a family. I always think mouse is not really a story about the Holocaust. It's a story about a son making sense of his father's story. So it's right. only mediated in a way. And there's a kind of reluctance art at some moment in the beginning of the second volume He's really struggling and saying, I'm making an artistic project out of tremendous suffering. And he's sitting there drawing on top of this pile of corpses. And there's this kind of prohibition, which I think today people cannot even reconstruct it. In 1980 or 1975, it was not considered okay, maybe, to write a story about the Holocaust. Today, we've gone through two decades of movies, of but films. It, but it's in part because of works like Mouse. So yes, there have been many movies, and some of them are bad, and some of them are good. You know, there's a... Right. I'm sure there's a huge range. But Mouse was one of the very first works to take on the Holocaust that doesn't end with a sort of happy ending in Israel, doesn't end with a kind of uplifting narrative of hope, does not sanctify the survivor. In a sense, does not of, do that weird Schindler's List thing where the story is told through the eyes of the savior Gentile. And what do you mean of the sanctification of the survivor? Well, I feel like that was something that Mouse did that in the 80s. So Art did the short version of Mouse in 1972, the three-page mm -hmm. version. And then he was working on it from the late 70s. Mouse 1 comes out in 1986. Mm -hmm. And Mouse 2 comes out in 1991 as books. But Mouse was serialized in Raw, mm -hmm. as I think you were referring to, from 1980. Right. So it was coming out in But chapters. it was underground and not, it wasn't exactly a major press and a lot of people paid attention to it. It really blew up when it, you know, became it, a book right. published by Pantheon. But I mean, in the 80s, in this context, you know, there were a lot of people in this sort of nascent 1980s, second generation movement who were angry about this book, who thought that it was disrespectful toward Art's father. Mm -hmm. And um, toward the memory to depict them as mice and cats, like a game of, yes. of animals or something. And also, I think it was just to even leverage, maybe leverage is the wrong verb, but to show criticism of his behaviors that were so evidently behaviors rooted in his experience in the war, like his miserliness, like collecting pieces of wire on the street, right? So here's the kind of this issue that now sets up, right? I mean, yes, there's a historical, personal, traumatic reason that Vladek became a hoarder of small bits of wire, and that has to do with his experience of, you know, imprisonment and, right. you know, survival. But it doesn't make it any less annoying for his kid. And, and that's kind of what Mouse was showing that hadn't gotten a lot of attention before. And I think it's a really fundamental part of why the story becomes 
such an American story. It's mm -hmm. Art grows up in the 50s and 60s. He yeah. grows up with mad comic books and, as he says, rock and roll. His yeah. parents come from a different world. Yeah. The world of the shtetl and the world of the Holocaust. Yes. It's not a world, really, which was just this hellish experience. And he's trying to figure out, is my father this miserly stereotype who just won't even use a match to light the right. stove this morning because he went through the Holocaust, right. or is he just that person? <laughs> right. And the second wife keeps on saying, no, he's always been like this. Everybody else went through the Holocaust around us. We have a lot of friends who are survivors. Right, and they're and not then, all like him. When I read it, I really, because I, I talked about the woman warrior a couple of weeks ago, Maxine Hong Kingston kept on saying, are my family so strange because they're Chinese or because they're my family? Right. <laughs> and she couldn't figure it out. She said, they were so strange. And I didn't right. understand whether it's because they don't belong in this culture. Right. Or because they're just weird. Right. So when you said he opened up something in the community of kids who'd grown up with survivor parents, who really... And this is hard for us to reconstruct. Didn't talk very much about the experience. No, it, it, wasn't it seems a big very industry. remote now because people talk about it a lot, but it just was different. And Mouse that opened that up to have a conversation, a yes. very honest conversation. Yes. That has two parts, which is this is what happened in the Holocaust. There's this historical fact in the past, and it stays in the past. Mm -hmm. It happened over there, it happened to my parents. But this is really a story about what happened to me as a child of survivors. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're saying it opened up this conversation among survivors saying, what did we live through with our parents? Right. And I think part of what that shows is that, I mean, this to me is the central premise of Mouse, is that the past is not past. Yeah. On some level, yes, it's over there in the past, in the old country. And on another level, it's right here in Queens in the 1970s. And what you said earlier, there was a sanctification or sort of either you ended up in Israel or you ended up in America, you made good, right. you became successful. Partly maybe his mother's suicide was definitely a kind of shocking event that said things were not that easy. Right. And he said something to me in MetaMouse that I think about often that I think this book really showcases, which is Art said, suffering doesn't make you a better person. Suffering just makes you suffer. Right. <laughs> Which, which seems evidently true, but I feel like people yet need to be reminded of it because so much cultural production in film and literature is about somehow, how do we redeem suffering? It's actually, and Art says, I think in that same quote, it's a very Christian notion. Yes. It's a kind of saintliness yes. to suffering because Christianity is built on that. Right. Your earthly suffering will bring you right. to heaven. He said, these people were treated abominably. They suffered terribly. Right. It didn't make them better people. Not at all. If <laughs> right. anything, they're traumatized. And that doesn't make anybody a better person. Right. And he goes out of his way in Base of Mouse to show that his father harbors his own racist feelings against, you know, black Americans, for example. So there's that scene. Where does he manifest that? There's a the kind of scene in the there's book. There's a black hitchhiker up in the Catskills. You know, he calls him a Schwarzer, like, you know, so pejorative right? Polish <laughs> term. And, you know, Art and his wife, Francoise, in the seen in the book they're horrified you know yeah so he doesn't want to pick him up art and francoise are, are slowing down the car to pick him up and he says you know push faster on the brakes <laughs> get away from this guy so and then francoise said i can't believe you are prejudiced after what the germans did to you as a jew right and then he responds saying is this very different this is completely different. right he said, right and in some ways he's saying i didn't develop a morality out of this which I think is a helpful thing for us all to keep in mind, especially, I mean, this is a different, a whole different right. conversation, but especially in the way the Holocaust is mobilized in Israeli politics. Right. For or in, in, in all politics. In all politics. I mean, in, in all politics, right? But and I, mean, I think there's a part of it, there's a political part, there's also a human part. It's very hard to acknowledge that suffering means really nothing, but you suffered. Right. Because it's meaningless. There isn't this deep meaning to... Right. It, it, there's nothing terrible, to recover. Right. It's not redemptive, say, oh, you know, they came out and then they marched into the sunset or something. And then, so you have Maus, which, as you said, it changed the landscape. People were, you know, objected to it, but other people also probably for the first time encountered a story told in this particular way. Mm -hmm. And Yeah. I mean, so Art, I think, does less of this now, but at the time he went around to conferences about the Holocaust. This is before he got really sick of doing stuff like that. And yes, I think, I mean, it changed so many things. And one of the things that changed was people's sense of taste and possibility. I mean, I remember him 
this is also in MetaMouse. I love this. Telling me about promoting the book at the Frankfurt Book Fair and someone stood up and said, you know, like, don't you think doing a comic book about Auschwitz is in bad taste? And he said, well, I think Auschwitz was in bad taste. <laughs> Just right. a, a pretty good, right. a pretty good comeback. Right. Yeah, right. But I think it really expanded people's sense of what forms are available to express right. inexpressible kinds of histories. Well, this idea of inexpressibility, that something cannot be expressed. So Spiegelman sat down and started drawing it. It took him 13 years, a very long time. So it wasn't easy. So he doesn't say, oh, you can use any genre you want. This restriction is idiotic. We should represent everything. Yeah, I mean, and that's what I love about comics as such an elliptical form. I mean, part of the intervention that I think the sort of world of comics and graphic novels makes with these kinds of histories is that it pushes against the idea that trauma isn't representable. Okay. And I like that. There's something to me that's very interesting in that, and it, it goes against a lot of the sort of doxa of trauma theory from the 90s, for example. You know, the invisibility, right. inaudibility, unrepresentability. It's like, okay, well, let's just try. But it's such an elliptical form, and it's so much about the... And can you say what you mean by elliptical? And Yeah, I mean, so just the frame gutter sequence yeah. that's the basic grammar of comics like yeah. a box of presents followed by a little strip of absence and then followed yeah. by another box of presents yeah. it's on the surface about selection mm -hmm. and about a sort of counterpoint mm -hmm. and about it's about presence but it's also about interstice and interval it's sort of built into the form it's a form as much about absence as about presence and you can see it sometimes you see your eye kind of takes in one or two or three panels, and sometimes the panels aren't all sequential. Right. Whereas narrative is actually quite sequential. Right, Read. it's non-directional. It can be quite non-directional right. for readers. And so you think it's an opening. This, there was an idea that trauma couldn't be represented. We have, at the same time, Claude Lanzmann makes Shoah, which is really a movie about that part of the Holocaust that cannot be shown. So it's a movie, as Lanzmann insisted, very dogmatically, and I think very rightly, it's entirely in the present. It's only survivor testimonies. There's no footage. No archival footage, right? That's his thing. That's his kind of aesthetic limit. There was an interesting debate, which we can hardly reconstruct today because it was a huge debate. And then Schindler's List comes out in 1993. And I remember Art Spiegelman on a panel here in New York City arguing against Schindler's List and saying this should not be represented. And there was a huge debate whether... I feel like that might have been sponsored by The Voice. Probably. I think it was just a great panel. It was a really interesting... It was a great... Yeah. And there was a debate a whether the it. shower scene in Schindler's List is a transgression. Right, because it takes you there and then it works out fine for that group of people. Yeah. Right, so but it's... they're surprised, oh, there's actually a real shower. Right. It's not the gas chamber. Right. Now you have afterwards... A movie I haven't seen, Son of Saul, 2015. I have seen that one. So that shows everything, right? I presume that's what I heard. Well, it's a grim ending. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah it, it's grim and then right. it's grim and then it's grim. Okay. Yeah. So, so Mouse changes something by opening up this space, but as you're saying, not in a simple way to turn it into a easily consumed narrative. Well, I love that we're talking, I mean... Again, I could have a whole other conversation about this because I'm intensely interested in this, but I love Shoah as like one pole right. and Schindler's List as another. Right. And kind of thinking about Mouse actually sort of in the middle. Yeah. Because Mouse isn't as pretentious as Shoah is. You know, it's not scenes of rustling fields. Like right. Art went to these places in Poland. Right. He went to Auschwitz twice. Right. He saw the wrestling fields, but what he wanted to reconstruct was what happened when people were actually there. So, right. so it is an intensely archival project, Mouse. Yeah. And it's sort of a drama about archives, right? Like, can he reconstruct his mother's lost archive, her And it's know, an interesting journals. thing for a comic book artist because it's yeah. very accurate and he spends a lot of time trying to get it right whether this is exactly the way the camp was set up right so very different impulse than Lonsman sort of showing the absence art wants to show the presence and i feel like yeah. this is what a lot of comics try to do on the other hand acknowledging these absences i think through right. comics form and through the fact that as you brought up in the beginning of our conversation this book is about mediation with a capital m from the very beginning really difficult mediation which i think there's a part of it it's getting the story of a holocaust survivor which is traumatic and very difficult to access but it's also a son getting close to his father right so i think for a lot of people there's a dimension of this book that is this is 
you have to try to understand your parents. Right. So that gives it a different dimension that even people who don't know much or have no direct relationship mm -hmm. to the Holocaust or that history connect to this book in a way to say this is someone trying to make sense of where he comes from. Right. Like, I think that gives it a universal dimension in a way that's not just specific to this history. Yeah, no, I agree. And the story of the family and navigating those parental relationships is really moving in Mouse. Right. And the fact that his father ends the book, and this, you know, happened in real life by calling him the name of his dead son. You know, the, these are sort of family dramas that anyone can feel right. connected right. to. But it doesn't do the thing that Schindler's List does, which is exist in a kind of classical Hollywood narrative right. Um, mode, right? So it has a narrative mode that people can relate to, which is a story about a family right. sort of struggling to relate right. to each other across generational differences um, and other kinds of differences, right, that have to do with immigration and culture and that type of thing. But it's it's... It's not the kind of triumphant narrative of Schindler's List. And it's not the super kind of cerebral, very powerful, emotional power work of Shoah, which took him, Lanzmann, 13 years, or a poet like Paul Celan, which is very abstract and very difficult, where language is so brittle that you almost cannot really understand. Yes, although I feel like Mouse is closer to Paul Celan than, than maybe you do. I mean... Maybe that's what I was trying to say about the abstraction yeah. of the form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even though not everyone might recognize this as abstraction, the abstraction of the animal metaphor. There, Mouse has a lot of visual abstraction. And I think if it tried to be more invested in mimetic right. realism, it wouldn't work. So you, and I think that's something that Mouse also brought to the table. Can you break down what's mimetic realism? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Aristotelian I mean, academic talk. Yes. <laughs> I mean, just... Just in a very basic way. For example, I don't, maybe the easiest example of this is, I don't think this book could exist if it tried to portray individualized faces mm. of historical figures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think there's something about the play of abstraction and specificity in Mouse that allows people to recognize that it is a constructed story. Oh, that's interesting. It's not aiming for transparency, but it is aiming for accuracy. The facts are accurate, yeah. but it's not invested in looking like, like realistic. Or, realistic. But it's really interesting when you just said that, I thought Vladek is this kind of triangular mouse face. Right. But somehow when you look at the panels, there's so much emotion in a few lines. Yeah, they're so very they're animated. Incredibly animated. Yeah. At the same time, it's so generic because everybody else looks like a mouse face. Right, and it's so abbreviated. Yeah. The artist said it's like an upside down triangle with right. dots. So it's really interesting, the, the but at the same faces. time, what you're saying, it has a truth to it, which is not the truth of that we would usually associate with factual reality realism. Right. It's not trying to look yeah. true, even though it's invested in being accurate. Right. Like it's not, um, he's not trying to draw Vladek's features There's... as they existed in real life. He's trying to express a quality of Vladek's face this, this, through um, these abbreviated lines. Abbreviated means simplified, just a few right. lines and few dots, and right. then you have a mouse face. Right. Tim O'Brien in The Things They Carried has this distinction between story truth and happening truth. Right. There's kind of story truth that this is what happened. We went to the field, this happened right. to us, five of us survived, the other ones didn't. Right. And then happening truth is actually what happened to him, which is not necessarily wrong but it doesn't right. have all the details that usually we think are needed to tell a true story right and what i love about Mao, so i teach a course on the vietnam war and expression on the vietnam war so i love your reference to that book but it's also even more complicated because it's a biography and an autobiography right so he's telling his father's story he is trying to get a lot of that happening truth there but then it's right. also the story about truth. his truth, <laughs> but also the story truth of his father. You know, it's such a right. dual book right. in so many right. ways. It's sort of equally about his experience and right. his father's experience. And both of them are, as you're saying, neither one becomes entirely, this is just the accuracy of the facts that is important to me. At the same time, Spiegelman wants to get nothing wrong. He, he wants does to, all this that's research. That's why it so took him 13 years. In so MetaMouse documents, there's in, nothing in incorrect. Intense amounts of research, right? And when this book came out and was put by the Times, when Mouse 2 came out and was put by the Times on the fiction side of the right. list, he complained. He said David Duke would be happy to hear this right. is all fiction. Right, right. <laughs> and he was right to complain. I have a funny um, 
I did a project with art once, and I did 110 Stories, this book about 9-11. Yeah, I love that book. It's a great book. He drew the cover. So he did the cover first for the Black on Black New Yorker cover, and then a year later he redid the cover for my book, which I didn't write. I'm very proud of this book because 110 other people wrote this book. (laughs) And then he was, I was in a studio, and he was drawing Battery Park City and the little tiny windows and all the buildings. And it took him a long time. He was on the computer drawing on some program. And I said, honestly, why are you spending so much time on this? He said, Uli, I'm a cartoonist. <laughs> I'm an underground cartoonist. I made it kind of big. Everyone is waiting for me to fuck up. I said, what do you mean? He said, if I get one window wrong, they're going to say, oh, you can't even draw. <laughs> so there's an, a sense in which he wanted to be accurate. Yeah. It, it didn't matter. I thought, who cares what the Battery Park City windows look like? He yeah. said, it matters to me. And then another thing he said about that cover, which I want to go back to when he said earlier about their hand-drawn panels. He said, a traumatic event such as 9-11 or the Holocaust not comparable, but, but com- both traumatic evidently on different levels. Traumatic, exactly. Right. He said, when someone has drawn it, you sense immediately someone already processed it manually. Yes. And it took time. Yes. He said, that is actually the mediation is part of what you experience. You don't just know it. He said, I can confront you with a photograph of the Holocaust 9 11. It's shocking. Right. If you confront it with a drawing, it's also shocking, but in a very different way. But, you know, someone's consciousness has intervened here. Yes, I love that. So John Berger has this great book about drawing that's less well-known than oh, his really? other work. It's called On Drawing. I absolutely love it. And he talks about drawing as seeing, seeing. Okay. Which yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. think is what, what right. you were just describing. There's time built into it. There's duration built into it. You always know you're seeing someone seeing the thing. Yeah, like all the little lines in the background of every single panel in the right. house. You know... Someone took the time, made the effort right. to put that through his mind and his hand. Right. And with the two inch high panels in Mouse, one of the things that was so fun working on this book, Meta Mouse, is that I spent a year just looking at Art's archive right. and sort of recreating a Meta Mouse archive from the Mouse archive. He had dozens of sketches for each panel in Mouse. For each little panel. For each little two inch high panel, all in different colors. Wow. Which is really fascinating because it's a book in black and white. So Why do you think he made that choice to turn it into black and white? Well, he has this sort of joke, which is that he always thinks that this era happened in black and white. For well, most of us, it did. <laughs> you know, watching I actually film did. footage and stuff like that. I wrote an essay once on some of the few extant color photographs from the ghetto in Wood. Oh, interesting. There's 240 photographs. So it's a quite of an interesting story because some Nazi accountant took these photographs. They're color slides, very unusual for 1944. Mm-hmm. Then they were hidden, and then after the war... His widow sold them and these guys from this Jewish archive went and bought them under the condition that they would never disclose the identity of this person and turned around immediately and betrayed her which is great Great. and said this is who the guy was it's but like they, the secret recording in Shoah the secret recording says I will never show this against them? Yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> betray that of course but color gives you a different dimension it gives you a false idea of immediacy oh no we really know right but there's something else like William Flusser the photography critic says Black and white actually looks more real to us because it abstracts reality. Yeah. Color distracts you and thinks, oh, there's a green tree and this is the blue sky. Right, it's like too replete somehow. right. Yeah. So he had color drafts. He had color drafts. It was a way, it was an old cartooning technique that Harvey Kurtzman, who started Mad Magazine, used to use of teaching yourself as a cartoonist the kind of visual volume of a frame. Wow. To do it in light colors that get successively darker. Okay. I mean, so I always tell this to students as a way to sort of point out how much wow. labor goes into cartooning. So he starts something with a light color. Something that looks easy. Because there's something about this. Art said this at some point. There's so much packed into every panel. Right. There's a huge amount of information. And I think the book is one of those books you read and you kind of absorb the narrative. And then you read it again and then you look at the pictures and you've missed a lot. Yeah, I like to point out to myself, <laughs> I worked on this book, Meta Mouse, about Mouse, with its author for six years. Wow. And I still feel like I haven't cracked it. Like ma- every time I reread Mouse, I feel like I learned something. So this technique new. where he starts with a lighter color and then gradually yeah. darkens it is to achieve what? To learn what about what each panel can contain? About the visual density of the panel. Okay. Just sort of like the relationship of objects in space. Okay. So, when you read it, how do you read this book? Do you read the little speech bubbles and you read through the text what's happening? Or do you actually then stop for each panel and look at who is doing what here? Well, that's what's so great about comics reading is that it's so non-directive because it's on a literal level, not linear in the way that prose right. is. Right. 
Art and I did a thing for MetaMouse where we talked about every single page of the book mm -hmm. and how it worked as an aesthetic unit, which was really fun. But but when I read it, there's so many details. Even though I've read it so many times, I right. miss out on the details. And I find those in these tiny panels when I reread these the book. Things, right? Can we talk about one page here? This is the orchestra scene, which you've discussed in MetaMouse and which artists discuss because there's a kind of question of accuracy. It used to be a very, very big question in Holocaust historiography, sort of in the shadow of these Holocaust negationists of what was accurate and whether eyewitness testimony was accurate. And, you know, I went through school at Yale in the 90s and in addition to Yad Vashem, Fortunate Archives was the first large archive of Holocaust survivor testimonies where testimonies became let's say, another source for historical knowledge. Right. And I mean, like in the testimony book by Dory Love and Shoshana Feldman, you know, about the archive, it's so interesting. But they're adding something. They used to say, you used to have the records, you used to have yeah. the German records, you used to have a few photographs, you used to know what happened, but you couldn't rely on eyewitnesses. And I did a lot of work reading books from the 40s and 50s where eyewitness testimonies were entirely dismissed. Yeah. And then something shifts both with the Eichmann trial, the Auschwitz trials in Frankfurt, and then suddenly people speaking up in the 80s. Like mm -hmm. when art comes onto the scene with Maus, it's the testimony has its own weight mm -hmm. next to true historical accounts. Right. In this panel, in this page here, 214, where the orchestra, he says there was an orchestra in Auschwitz, right? And his father says, no, I don't remember an orchestra, right? So when you talk, when you did MetaMouse, when there was sort of facts that Art had discovered through his research and his father didn't confirm them, how did he manage that in the book? One of the things I love about this page is I feel like it reveals at the sort of central project of this book, which we've been talking about in implicit and explicit ways so far, which is that it's both a story of Art's research and Art's struggle to visualize Auschwitz, and it's a story of Vladek's testimony. Mm -hmm. He lets Vladek have the last word, literally, right. right? Right. You know, like, okay. But then he draws the orchestra anyway. <laughs> so it sort of shows what comics can do as right. a cross-discursive right. medium that's letting its reader know that it's dealing with different narrative levels at once. So it's like the silent information on the page. Yes. There's, a, there's a pictorial, there's a representation of the orchestra. Then his father says, there was no orchestra. And Art keeps on drawing it, saying, saying, but I know there was one. Right. But you said there wasn't one. So you now have two different levels of right. information. You have two different levels of information, you know, at least two right. that are coexisting <laughs> on the page. At least two. Are there more? <laughs> <laughs> are there more? Well, you know, there's all sorts of different ways that one could interpret this. But he has, okay, this is my view from my research. Right. And this is my father's view from his experience being there. Right. So he's giving us at least two options. And I think what's amazing about this book is as a reader, you're kind of put there to say, I don't think I can choose one is more valid than the other because it's as much Art Spiegelman's story as it is Vladek's story. Well, this is why this is part of why I probably love this book so much is because I feel like this book is about so many things. But centrally to me, what this book is about is how we construct history. Right. And so it's always calling our attention to the different discourses that go into what we think of as history with a capital H. And right? we construct history because history is not just the things that happened in the past. Right, right. Because they happened in the past, but they have no relationship or bearing on us right. until they do. Right. And then we have to figure out what this relationship is. Right. It's also showing something that I think is really interesting, which is, as you were saying, the weight of eyewitness testimony, which is often in this book oral, and sort of counterbalancing that with the weight of archival research with documents. And it's sort of giving us that clash, right. too. The eyewitness testimony, so at the Yale archives, you know, they have thousands and I transcribed many, many testimonies for a long time, which I can now research. Very few of them have been accessed, which is actually quite Depressing. tragic in a way, because I transcribed about 80 testimonies from Roma and Sinti, how they call themselves, which we would call gypsies, but they insisted on calling themselves Roma and Sinti in German and French. And then very few people have used them for research. So what's actually this book is also about, Maus, is that 
a survivor story doesn't exist until it finds an addressee or someone to listen to it. Right. That's in so much of the best academic writing about testimony coming out in the 90s, especially from Yale. You know, testimony needs an addressee. Right. right. I think that was a major It needs insight, this sort of scene of interlocution. Which they modeled on psychoanalysis or therapy frameworks or art. Right. Actually art, not Art Spiegelman, but art as a practice to say it creates an audience. Mm -hmm. And I always try to think of this, they say there's history, as you said, with a capital H. There are documents, there are archives that one could not get through in a lifetime. There's so much documentation right. now. But none of this matters until it creates somebody in the present who actually absorbs this information right. and receives it. And Art Spiegelman receives it in a very traumatic way. Right. Not so, in the easy way that, oh, this is my father's story, I'm going to write it down now. Right. So there's this sort of recursive or doubled witness where his father is a witness to these events and then Art becomes a witness right. to his father's testimony. Right. Which needs a witness, which is like searching for a witness, right. as one might have said right. then. For Maoist, in terms of the American canon, I remember actually when I was in college or graduate school, it was added to a list of American literature, sort of post-war literature. Yeah. And I think you said you read it first in graduate school. Yes. And it became sort of a book you read it with, there was William Faulkner and Hemingway, <laughs> maybe not no longer Hemingway, I don't know, we put in the canon today and maybe there was probably Toni Morrison in there yeah. and then there's Mouse. And that was a big deal that this was added to what authorities felt this is the canon of American yeah. literature. and Mouse is a book in this canon now. I mean, I love the fact that it is in the canon and that it's so accepted in that way. I have taught an introduction to literary studies class for, you know, like first semester English majors. Right. And what do I teach? Charlotte Bronte, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Toni Morrison, Mouse. <laughs> you know? And how do the students respond? It blows their mind. That it, this is it absolutely blows their mind. It doesn't blow their mind that a comic is part of the canon. It blows their mind because they're so fascinated by it. Of what it does. Yeah, because they've never seen anything like it. And so to me, if I think about who's important, right. like as a contemporary literature scholar, which is my general background, like this this book has absolutely changed literature. Right. Like what we consider literature. Indubitably. You know, that's a pretty important thing. It does so much. And I think for students or people who are not really used to reading maybe, you know, the entire canon. Yeah. It opens up the idea that you can tell two things at once. Yeah. That the present is haunted by the past and you can somehow account for that. Right. That actually we live in a present, but the past is all around us. We don't just sequentialize it. Right. So I think it opens up these dimensions, which we consider modernism or something like that, that it's harder, I think, to access in other ways. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought up modernism because I feel like so much of what a work like this does is experiment with time and space right. in a way that's actually quite simpatico with a lot of, you know, modernist I did a, literary and visual techniques. I had a conversation <laughs> with Sherrod Stark on Virginia Woolf's uh -huh. The Lighthouse recently yeah. where 10 years pass in two pages and right. then she spends 80 pages on one afternoon. Right. And what that book does, it teaches us how we experience time. Like right. We actually don't know that we just think we go right. through time and it's all uniform. Of course, it isn't. Just like Vladek went through this time. And yeah. This, then you're skipping a bunch of stuff. Yeah, this is really a book about time right. and the experience of right. time. And where Art Spiegelman is today in relation to this. Right. I also think when you listen to Art, I think what's really charming, but also rather poignant, that he's sort of grumpy about this. He's not sort of, oh, I was lucky to have this amazing story at my disposal. He said... I had to make sense of the worst thing of history. Well, I appreciate his grumpiness. I mean, so I have sort of like two things to say there. One is that I feel like there's a weird backlash against a lot of people working in memoir where people think that creators who have difficult stories are lucky because they have material. Because there's such an ambivalent view of memoir these days. And that always disappoints me, you know? Like, you're lucky you have this horrible story, you have material. So I'm glad that Art's grumpy about that because, you know, like you said, suffering doesn't make you a better person, right. it just makes you suffer. And he certainly right. did suffer and he kind of made a space for the suffering of families, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of survivors, in addition right. to just right. focusing on the suffering of survivors. But I also feel that he has gotten less grumpy in the past few months about Mouse particularly... So I feel like he is owning the Jewish identity politics that come with Mouse now, 
and what in a this? way he was allergic to for like the past 35 years. Because he has a very grumpy, very post war American very Jewish, about Jewish attitude identity. about himself. <laughs> like, oh, I'm a bad Jew. I don't, I barely know the rituals. And he just, I don't think he feels guilt. He doesn't no. feel guilty about that. No, I <laughs> no, think he just he's, feels like this is how I am. Right? He just feels sort of, and this is part of why this book is so successful too, is that he's very aversive to easy identity politics. So, so what's happened in the last couple of months? What's his shift? I or think what after do you think? the. The Trump election, I mean, that sort of set the ground for it and all of the anti-Semitism and the weird dog whistles and everything. And then also the Pittsburgh shooting of the sh- synagogue, synagogue yeah. shooting. Yeah. I mean, Art doesn't like synagogues. He doesn't like the religious part of Judaism at all. But I think that he realized that people were getting something out of mouse and that it was still relevant right right now that kind of question mark about trauma and jewish identity and i think he felt instead of feeling grumpy that that mouse is still so relevant he felt like moved that mouse is still so relevant i mean it blew my mind to take us on a different track really quickly this past summer mouse made a cameo on that television show the handmaid's tale Mm -hmm. oh really which you know is about this Dystopian. Theocratic, <laughs> dystopian future. Right. And there's a scene in which a character is shown uh, surreptitiously reading Mouse. Mm. And I thought this is so interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mouse is actually being offered as like a sign of resistance. Right. In this imagined future dystopia. Right. And so I felt like as a scholar of Mouse, I felt like, wow, this is so interesting. Like in this moment now in the 21st century, like Mouse hasn't lost that powerful sense that it's addressing really serious issues about identity and resistance. And as we would say, terribly so. Right. How and it's dep- terrible that, that and context is so unfortunate. That there's relevance right? to any of right. this. And that it, actually, right. we would think that targeting minorities, that right. the gradual discrimination that's the beginning of this book, which doesn't start in the camps, because right. a lot of Holocaust books are set, they start at the arrival, and he said, this is a book about the creeping discrimination, right. exclusion, right. harassment, and terror of yeah. these populations, Yeah, that this is relevant today. Yeah, so it's the context is depressing, and I think Art has realized that, and so he started to own that way his book is received, right. finally. Interesting, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's unfortunate. <laughs> it's unfortunate. But, but... It's, it's unfortunate at the same time. It is kind of a note to end on to say this is a book worth reading more than, you know, ever in a way. It didn't lose its relevance. It's no. now, I don't know how old it is, 30 years or something like that? Yeah. Like, it, it, so first, ago. volume one, yeah. 86, volume yeah. two, 91. Yeah. yeah. And Meta Mouse, can you just say another word about this, a book you edited with Art Spiegelman? Sure. So we worked for five or six years on a book about all of the family historical and stylistic research that went into his 13 year process of making mouse. Mm -hmm. So one of the things he wanted to do was to do something where he answered the questions that he felt that over decades he got asked the most often. Why mice? Why right. cats? Why the Holocaust? I mean, <laughs> right. why comics? Right. So he had this grumpy attitude about it even then. I mean, I love the book and we worked really hard on it, but he said he wanted to make it definitive so that he could just hand the book to someone. He wouldn't have to keep talking about it. But I think that kind of attitude has shifted. Yeah. But I, I also think that he enjoyed working on the book more than what I just said might indicate I mean, it was, so we did a thing unconsciously set up by art where we mirrored the structure of Mouse. I would go over to his studio and interview him just the way he interviews his father. I think the Meta Mouse, what I love about that book, Meta Mouse, as we said, there's nothing redemptive about this experience, this historical event, but there is something to actually be offered a glimpse into the creative process of someone who took something so incredibly seriously and really wanted to be truthful yeah. to someone else's experience. I think that is actually really an amazing thing to see into the workshop of what kind of effort was necessary to get someone else's story right. Yeah, and it, it was a huge, a huge effort on his part on many different fronts. And you must have absorbed a lot of secondhand smoke. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, uh, you know, at the time I was having my own cigarettes, but um, <laughs> okay, I, I don't think this person would mind I said this, but Art and I have a cartoonist friend who says after going to art studio, 
he used to feel like his sweater had cancer <laughs> from the second hand <laughs> right, smoke. Right. But yeah, we would sit around and talk and, you know, smoke cigarettes for hours. Yeah. And he never wanted to know the questions in advance. It, it was very much like this. This, I'm sorry, well, pointing to the book, like the structure of Mouse where you sort of show up and you don't know what you're going to get. And it's not right. preordained. It's not pre-mapped out. And this person who you're interviewing could go off on this tangent or this tangent. You know, then we got all of our conversations over two years. We just talked for two years. Mm. Then we got them professionally transcribed and then I edited them. Did you discover things in the editing that you hadn't even remembered hearing? Were there things because for two it's yes. a long time. Yes, <laughs> yes, I did. Hard. But I think this is actually an important part, what you said. You talking to Art Spiegelman was in a way him talking to Vladek. It wasn't just he wanted to know the facts, have them confirmed. It was about the relationship that takes place in a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in dialogue, something else happens. Yes. And I remember him telling me this. I mean, it weirdly took me a while to realize, because again, it wasn't conscious that we were replicating some of the primary structures of mouse right, right. in this sort of interview. Like so you became mirroring kind it. of an interviewer to somebody else, to his process. What, yes. You were sort of interviewing him, but what have you gone through for 13 years writing this book? Yes. And, you know, he told me once that he didn't really have a relationship with Vladek Spiegelman, with his father, outside of doing Mouse. That Mouse was, it wasn't incidental, it was the site right. of their relationship. It enabled them to have a relationship. Interesting. Or they weren't angry at each other. Right, right, right. right. And so, yeah, it's not just about transmitting information, it's about something in excess of that. Creating a relationship. Yeah. Which is very difficult. Right. Ten years. Yeah. And creating a narrative somehow yeah. together. Co-creating it. Right. Yeah. Or it was, well, it's like the testimony finding the witness. Right. Thing. Exactly. But our book was testimony to creative process. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, Hillary, thank you so much for joining me on Think About It. It was really so much fun. I really appreciate it. And then I hope to have you back on the podcast for another graphic novel at some Anytime. point. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great.